Welcome everybody to the Zoology Podcast for October. So I'd like to say off the bat that I'm a little ill this month. So if the podcast sounds a little different, it's probably why it's because I've got the sniffles. But anyway, in this podcast we'll be covering game theory, explaining what it is, how game theory relates to evolution, and we'll cover a few examples of games such as the Hawks vs. Doves and the Prisoner's Dilemma. If that sounds like fun, then enjoy listening. The key pioneers of game theory were the mathematicians John von Neumann and the economist Oskar Morgenstern in the 1940s, while in the 1950s the mathematician John Nash provided the first significant extension to von Neumann's and Morgenstern's work, known as the Nash Equilibrium. But it wasn't until the 1970s that game theory was explicitly applied to evolution. Now that's all well and good, but what exactly is game theory? Well, game theory is a study of mathematical models which focus on the interacting choices of rational individuals and the outcomes of those choices. Or to put it another way, game theory tries to model the choices rational people make during a specified circumstance and the strategic outcomes that are produced from their choices interacting. This means that the key to game theory is that one player's outcome depends upon the interaction produced between their own choice and that of another player. Right. Now let's cover some common terminology used within the game theory. The game is any set of circumstances whose result is dependent upon the action of two or more of its players. The players are the individuals who make strategic decisions within the game based off the information they have been given and with an aim towards a desired outcome. When the players have made the decision, they reach the equilibrium, the point in a game where the players have made their decisions. From this, the Nash equilibrium from our friend John Nash can be reached. This is where it's not rational for a player to deviate from their current strategy, as their strategy is currently the best option to reach their desired payoff. The payoff is what the players actually receive after the outcome of the game. This can be in any form from economic or material to biological or social. It all depends on the circumstances of the game and what is being studied. A key concept to keep in mind is when dealing with game theory is the assumption that players will perform rationally and also try to maximise their payoffs at the end of the game. Also, the number of players in a game can theoretically be infinite. However, most games tend to be simplified with only a couple players or a small group playing. These games come in many types. Players can choose their decision at the same time or one after the other depending on the game and situations can be cooperative or non-cooperative depending on the circumstances and the choices involved. Games which focus on cooperative game theory tend to deal with how teams or cooperative groups of individuals interact when only the payoffs are known. This allows us to learn about how teams will allocate the payoff among the players and why they made their decisions. Non-cooperative games tend to pit one player against another, where the players know all the available strategies and all outcomes from playing one strategy against another. For example, Rock, Paper, Scissors is this type of game. Alright, now that we know all this, I'm going to take us through two of the most famous games within game theory, those being The Prisoner's Dilemma and The Volunteer's Dilemma. Let's start with... hmm, the lesser known game, The Volunteer's Dilemma, and you, my friend, are going to be the volunteer. So, in A Volunteer's Dilemma, you have to undertake a challenge or a job for what is perceived as the common good. The worst possible outcome for yourself and other people is realised if nobody volunteers at all. But by volunteering yourself, you place a great personal burden upon your shoulders, and this burden could be costly. For example, consider you work at a bank within a junior role. You find out one day that Maria, a manager from accounting, is committing fraud and has been committing fraud for so long its roots go deep and has become widespread within the company. Now you may know this alongside some other juniors, but the top ranks of the bank are completely unaware. Now you may decide to tell the top management of this fraud, and this would then result in all employees involved in the fraud being fired, but this includes both those who knowingly did fraud and those who were unaware. On top of this, it would also result in you being branded as a whistleblower, and this may result in you facing some unknown consequence in the future. However, if you don't volunteer, then the large-scale fraud may result in the bank's eventual bankruptcy and the loss of everyone's job. So, what do you do? Now, personally, I'm not very good at these kinds of questions, because my brain desperately goes looking for loopholes, such as not telling people straight away, look for another job, and then before you have changed jobs, tell the top brass, and then boom, all crisis averted, and you don't have to be there for when the proverbial shit hits the fan. But again, I don't think this is how the game is meant to be played. 
Anywho, let's move on to the most famous game within game theory, the prisoner's dilemma. So consider this, two criminals are arrested for a serious crime. However, the prosecutors have no hard evidence to convict them on, therefore the prosecutors will need a confession to convict them. Now to gain a confession, the police remove the criminals from their solitary cells and question each one separately in a room where the criminals have no ability to communicate between themselves. The police then present four deals to each criminal. This is normally represented on paper in a 2x2 two two box. The first deal is that if both confess, they will each receive a reduced prison sentence of five years. The second deal is that if criminal 1 confesses but criminal 2 does not, criminal 1 will get their charges dropped and the confession will be used to give criminal 2 a 10 year prison sentence. Third deal is the opposite, being that if criminal 2 confesses but criminal 1 does not, Criminal 2 will get their charges dropped and their confession will be used to give Criminal 1 a 10 year prison sentence. And the final deal is that if neither confesses, each will serve 2 years in prison on another charge unrelated to the serious crime. So, what should each criminal do? The dilemma faced here by the criminals is that whatever the other does, each is individually better off confessing than remaining silent. Yet, the outcome when both confess is worse for each than the outcome they would have got if they both remained silent. I think this puzzle illustrates well the conflict between the individual based and the group based rationality. Sometimes when an individual does not know all the information, then making the rational self interested choice may not result in the best payoff than making a less rationally self interested choice. Now a few of you may have noticed something. This payout was only illustrative of one round of a game. But what would happen if the criminals knew that there would be multiple rounds of confession or silences? Well this completely changes the game because the criminals are then exposed to the answers of their accomplice after the payoff. So if both criminals stayed silent then they learn that there is possible trust between them and maybe this will make them more likely to continue on choosing the same deal. But what if criminal 1 stayed silent while criminal 2 confessed? What if each criminal learned then? Well, this was explored by Anatole Rapoport in the 1980s, who used a computer to play iterated games of the prisoner's dilemma. He determined that the optimal strategy was what was known as tit for tat, that being criminals will follow a course of action consistent with their opponent's previous turn. For example, if criminal 1 stayed silent, then criminal 2 will stay silent on the next round, but if player 1 had confessed, then player 2 will confess on the next round. Okay, now that we have a basic handle of game theory, what does this have to do with evolution and biology? Well, evolutionary game theory differs from classical game theory in a significant way. It focuses more on the dynamics of strategy change between individuals and the occurrence of these competing strategies within a population. Now currently there are two approaches to evolutionary game theory. One approach is to construct an explicit model of the processes by which the frequency of strategies change within a population and then study the dynamics of how predefined properties change within the model over time. For example, you might be looking at the frequency of mating strategy used within a population over 50 generations. From this you can then look at, say, how mating strategy relates to the participant's physical aggression. From this you can come to an understanding of how aggression affects the frequencies of mating strategies over the generations. The second approach employs the concept of an evolutionary stable strategy as a tool of analysis. But what is an evolutionary stable strategy? Well, it is a state within a game's dynamic where in a large population of competing strategies, another rare, new or mutant strategy cannot enter the population and disrupt the existing dynamic. This basically means that the Nash equilibrium has been reached, so it is now no longer rational for a player to change their strategy as long as the current frequencies of strategies remain constant because this specific frequency of strategies makes any change in strategy result in a more detrimental outcome for the individual. So overall, a successful evolutionary stable strategy must be both effective at doing two things. The first is be successful at negating a rare or new competing strategy from taking root within the population, and the second is be effective at maintaining itself within the current population against the other competing strategies. This includes itself. This means several evolutionary stable strategies can exist within a competitive scenario at the same time. The frequencies of these strategies can be studied as they change depending on external circumstances. Now, it is key to remember that the evolution considered by evolutionary game theory does not need to be biological evolution through natural selection. 
Evolution, instead, can often be understood as a cultural or behavioural evolution, which refers to change in beliefs and actions over time. This makes evolutionary game theory particularly appropriate for the modelling of social systems or behavioural strategies, because evolutionary game theory is not reliant on individuals making purely rational choices. Although this certainly is present in many games, overall this makes evolutionary game theory far more dynamic. As Maynard Smith in The Preference to Evolution and the Theory of Games noted, paradoxically, it has turned out that game theory is more readily applied to biology than that of the field of economic behaviour for which it was originally designed. Actually, Mr Smith was the man who realised that the evolutionary version of game theory does not require players to act rationally at all. It only requires that each player has a strategy. Okay, so now that we know what is being studied, but how is it actually done? Well, it's all done through the use of computers and algorithms. The results of a game reveal how good a strategy is within defined parameters, which is comparable to how evolutionary pressure reveals how good strategies are for the ability of an individual to survive and reproduce. This concept is taken and then computerized within evolutionary game theory into algorithmic strategies, which are treated as genetically inheritable traits that control an individual's action. These strategies are then pitted against each other within a population, or present at different frequencies. Each player aims to produce as many copies of themselves as they can, using unchangeable reproductive strategy, which they are born with, and which each one of their offsprings will inherit. The payoff for each game strategy is measured in units of reproductive fitness. The more fit a player, the greater their ability to reproduce themselves against the game circumstances and the strategies of other players. Now each game is always multiplayer with many competitors. Each game also features a rule for asexual replication without mutation. Asexual reproduction is used for simplicity. This results in players who are using fitter strategies to spawn a greater number of replicas, or less fit strategies end up being cold. The games are run repetitively, with no terminating condition. This allows the results to show how the dynamics change within a population the success of strategies, and if any equilibrium states are reached. Okay, now that may all sound a bit complicated, so I'm going to try to simplify this for everyone. Imagine that we have a board containing one bug species which uses two different types of strategy for getting food. One moves quickly but requires double the amount of food to remain alive per day, while the other moves at half the speed but requires half the food to live. Now, we have set the replication rule as each player needing to consume double its daily required food to replicate itself. We can now see what strategy is successful depending on the parameters we program. For instance, say we place a species on a small board on which four times the amount of food that each bug needs to survive is generated per day. If we start out with each strategy being represented equally, we can see in these conditions which strategy is fitter. What strategy do you think would be the fittest in this circumstance? What about if we significantly reduce the food, which strategy is fitter then? Or what if we increase the size of the board? See, by using game theory we can come to understand aspects of evolutionary phenomenon. One of the most famous examples of this was the understanding of the approximately equal sex ratio of many species. Until the 1930s, we struggled to understand why so many species have approximately equal sex ratios in their offspring, despite the majority of males never producing offspring at all. In these species, non-mating males evidently just seem disposable. However, Sir Ronald Fisher realised, if we measure individual fitness in terms of the expected number of grandchildren, then individual fitness depends on the distribution of males and females within a population. When there are more males in a population, Females have a higher individual fitness because they have access to more reproductive opportunities. Yet when there is a greater number of females in the population, males have a higher individual fitness for the same reason. So, if we say a rat reproduced mostly females, their genes for this would quickly be pressured out of the gene pool in favour of a more equal sex ratio because these genes lead to a reduction in the amount of grandchildren produced, a reduction in fitness. It is this which Sir Fisher shared as our understanding that the relative frequency of males and females in the population introduces a strategic element for evolution to act upon. Okay, now let's look at some of the most famous games within evolutionary game theory and what they can teach us. The first game I was taught about was the hawk versus dove game. It teaches us about why most animal contests involve only ritualistic fighting behaviour or threats rather than outright slaughter. In this game, two or more players contest over a shareable resource. 
Each player has two strategies to action, either playing like a hawk or playing like a dove. The hawk first displays aggression and then will escalate into a fight from which it will win or become injured and lose. The chance of this happening is normally set around 50%. The dove also first displays aggression, but if its opponent is also aggressive, then the dove will run away to safety. Yet if the opponent is not aggressive, the dove will share its resource. The payoff of the game depends on the probability of a player meeting a hawk or a dove, which also presents the percentage of hawks and doves in the contesting population, while the population of both strategies is determined by the results of the previous contest. From this game we understand that if the cost of losing a fight is more than the value of gaining the resource, which is normally the case, then this ends in an evolutionary stable strategy. If the change in the population happens due to, say, external circumstances, then this evolutionary stable strategy is likely to return in the coming generations. So, from this we can determine that when competing over a shareable resource, it's not normally worth an animal's life to fight to the end over such a resource. But what if the resource is not shareable? Well, this is the premise of the game known as War of Attrition. In this model, a sequence is presented where the outcome differs only in degrees. Imagine an MMA match, in which the longer the match goes on, the fighters within this match have to decide if continuing the match is really worth their health and stamina. Now, if an unshareable resource is combined with a high cost of losing a contest, such as excessive injury or death, then both the hawk and dove strategy's payoffs are diminished. A better strategy, therefore, because it is less costly for the player, is one of bluffing. Bluffing that you will fight, but instead just waiting for your competitor to run away. This, however, makes the game become one of accumulating costs. Either the energetic cost of displaying the bluff, or the cost of the prolonged unresolved engagement which could eventually result in an actual fight. Therefore, it becomes effectively an auction. The winner is a competitor who will accumulate the, greatest, the greater cost before fleeing, while the loser gets a similar cost as a winner but no resource. This circumstance makes any strategy in the War of Attrition unpredictable, because any strategy that is either unwavering or predictable becomes unstable. All it takes for an unwavering contestant to not pass on their strategy is another unwavering contestant, as both contestants are likely to get injured and possibly die, while predictable contestants will eventually be supplanted by a mutant strategy which relies on the fact it can just best the existing predictable strategy by investing just a wee bit more energy in waiting, thereby ensuring it wins the resource. With all of this in mind, then only a random and, un and unpredictable strategy can maintain itself within a population of bluffers. This means that effectively each contestant chooses an acceptable cost to be incurred in relation to the value of the resource being sought. Basically, each player makes a random bid for the resource and this eventually results in an evolutionary stable strategy and all the wonderful threats and bluffing behaviour we see when animals compete over many unshareable resources, such as mates. Now, for the final game of the podcast, it's about how the prisoner's dilemma sheds light on the evolution of altruistic behaviour. The existence of altruism has always been a challenge to the theory of evolution, even recognised by the man who created the theory, Charles Darwin. So, on its surface, the evolution of altruistic behaviour makes no sense when considering the basis for selection is the individual, or at least their genes. How could doing a behaviour that is costly to yourself, but beneficial to others, possibly increase your own fitness? Especially when considering that in many cases, doing such a behaviour results in direct decreases in your own reproductive fitness. But yet, we see in many social animals altruistic behaviour existing, from stories of dolphins helping humans stranded at sea, to simple guarding behaviour where one animal keeps a lookout for predators at the cost of making themselves more visible and therefore more likely to be the victim of a predator's attack. The solution to this problem was found in the application of evolutionary game theory to the Prisoner's Dilemma game, which found that altruistic strategies can arise through three circumstances, those being kin selection, direct reciprocity, and indirect reciprocity. Let's start with kin selection. Animals which exhibit altruistic behaviour tend to heavily discriminate between those who are their relatives and those who are not, in favour of their relatives. Just think of it as this, you don't get the random neighbour down the street a massively expensive Christmas present, but you may get one for your spouse or your children. Now, in evolutionary game theory, when the cost of altruistic action is less than the benefit to the recipient, times the coefficient of the relatedness between the two animals, 
then altruistic behaviour is likely to occur. This is known as Hamilton's rule. Putting it another way, the more related two animals are, the more altruistic behaviour you get, because by being altruistic you increase the chance of genes which you are sharing being passed on in the future. For example, helping a sibling has a coefficient of 1 over 2, because on average siblings share half of their genes. Therefore, by ensuring that enough of a sibling's offspring survive to adulthood, it means that you don't need to reproduce to have the same genetic impact on the population. It is important to remember that it is the genes which experience multiple rounds in this game, not the individual biological vehicle of the genes. It is this that makes it beneficial for my genes if I were to sacrifice my life for, say, more than two siblings, four nephews or eight cousins. You can see from this example that the degree of relatedness heavily impacts the coefficient value for altruistic behaviour occurring. However, altruistic behaviour does exist between individuals which are distantly related or not kin at all. Direct reciprocity is the act of, I'll scratch your back if you'll scratch mine. This type of behaviour tends to arise when the individuals are grouped together in a multi-round game. This grouping means trust can be built on favours, while defectors can be punished. I like to think a good example of this is vampire bats. These bats live in colonies which can number from a few individuals to a few hundred. Now the interesting thing about vampire bats is not only that they live on blood, but that they can only survive about two days without a meal. This represents a serious problem because vampire bats are not guaranteed to find a meal within this time. So what is a bat to do? Well, hungry vampire bats will actually beg other bats in the colony for regurgitated blood. Now, these bats can be very distantly related, so you'd think that by giving away a meal, a volunteer would not benefit really at all. And this can be true. However, a quick turnaround in hunger means that any bat who doesn't volunteer food might themselves not be given food when they are hungry in the future, and would therefore likely die. So, it can be within the bat's benefit to give blood if they can, especially so if the bats can remember who has given blood and who has refused to give blood in the past. Okay, moving on to our last altruistic act, that being indirect reciprocity. This is the act of trading favours, but without grouping up and therefore knowing who is will return the favour. This type of altruistic behaviour can be seen in species which live in clusters of individuals, which also interact over extended time periods. I think the individualistic Western human societies are a good example of this. With this social situation, the game is highly susceptible to defection, as direct retaliation is pretty much all but impossible. For instance, if you are putting your groceries from your shopping cart into your car, it takes energy to walk that shopping cart all the way back to the stand you got it from, but if you just leave the cart out in the parking lot, no one is likely to stop you, and many may not even notice. So if you defect on putting it back, you benefit and save energy and time. So, how does the rest of society deal with this defection? Well, this is where the social scores come in. When an individual becomes a known social defector, it begins to hurt their social standing, and this will have a negative effect on how other individuals treat that person in the future. This is represented in evolutionary game theory as a modified version of Hamilton's rule, where the probability of knowing the social score must be greater than the cost-benefit ratio. This means that players must have a higher social score than the risk of cost for the other players to interact in a potential collaboration. Players which use social scores to determine the worth of cooperating with another player are called discriminators. Discriminating in this way is a highly cognitively complex strategy, as it requires the specific identification of an individual and the labelling of a social score to that individual. This discrimination then, in turn, acts as a pressure for other players not to defect as much. Now isn't this all just amazing? From using evolutionary game theory, we can understand the pressures which cause specific behaviour to evolve and sustain themselves. Well, I for one think that's amazing. I don't know about you. Now, this is fun. Can you perhaps think of a behaviour you do that is the evolutionary game theory? I know I for one always put back the trolley, because I know that if I don't, then in the end it just won't benefit me. Because if the order of putting back the trolleys breaks down, then I just don't want to have to walk across a parking lot every time I go shopping and find a trolley which could be anywhere. That's just utter madness. <laughs>